This video is sponsored by Raycon. Now that most of us are firmly in the bitter winter months, I think now is the perfect time to cover one of the most unique, brutal, and intelligent snow westerns I've ever had the pleasure of uncovering. In the most reductive sense, you could describe this one as a survival slasher flick that mixes the meta humor of Scream with historical surroundings, superstitions, and intense cannibalism, but honestly, it's actually a tremendous disservice to compare it to anything else out there, because it truly stands apart as its own genreless gem of ingenuity. Ravenous tells the story of Fort Spencer, an isolated military outpost located deep within the Syrian Nevada mountains, where its occupants consist of military outcasts exiled to this frozen purgatory to wallow in their own self-pity, vanity, and uh, utter disconnect from reality. We descend into this bleak cabin fever from the perspective of Lieutenant John Boyd, the sole survivor of a massive during the Mexican-American War of the mid-1800s, who upon emerging from a pile of bodies made up of his own men, reluctantly captures a Mexican command post while their backs are turned, and is rewarded for his heroism. However, Boyd is soon confronted about the dubious nature of his bravery, in which he actually played dead in an understandable state of cowardice and abandoned his men to their fate, with his victory essentially being a sneaky last-minute opportunity that in any other situation would be considered indirectly tactical, but uh, unsportsmanlike, let's say. As such, the general reposts him to Fort Spencer under the command of the depressed and disillusioned Colonel Hart and his eccentric men, the testosterone fueled Private Reich, the manic drug addict Cleves, the religious Toffler, and the gullible alcoholic Major Knox. Each man has their own ambiguous reason for exile, but the gist is that Boyd fits perfectly amongst them, as he faces a punishment worse than death, as he's doomed to live with his guilt, trauma, and cowardice that is soon put to the test with the arrival of a mysterious Scottish traveller called Colhoun. I'll come back to this shortly because besides the eerie, methodical build-up to the main conflict worth experiencing for yourself, it's important to understand how the film leans on a heavy thematic overtone to drive the subtleties of the story. At its very core, Ravenous is a story about raw, moralist survival. It's a commentary on man's ravenous, albeit distasteful, need for self-preservation in a wilderness untamable by the law and order these men claim to uphold. In other ways, it's a character study about hypocrisy, as even our most relatable, cherished protagonist John Boyd can't escape his own weakness and fallibility. In fact, as you'll come to see, there are no real heroes or villains, despite Boyd's efforts at redemption against the mysterious Calhoun, who embodies man's in insatiable hunger for greed and power, perhaps representing our own worst evil, so to speak. It makes it clear through the metaphor of a purgatory that good and bad no longer exist in a place that's basically conditioned to be a dumping ground for men who haven't done anything technically wrong besides the morally debatable paths they took to get to where they are, Calhoun included. Instead, Ravenous is distinctly about humans stripped of the morals, values, and stoicism that define them in their civilized lives. Now they've reverted to animals simply surviving without a Cause, sinful without any real desire for forgiveness or ascension, given they only made their choices in the neum of survival. Morality. The last bastion of a coward. A lot of this might sound like gibberish, but I hope it gets across the vibe this movie goes for. It's both a visually and existentially harrowing watch, because it spends just as much time contemplating the significance of violence in the vein of survival as it does actually indulging in it. So now that I've set the scene, let's get into where things really intensify. As always, as we go along, please leave your thoughts in the comments below, including what topics I should cover in 2023, and lastly, here are a few words from this video's sponsor, Raycon. The holidays are finally here, which means you're probably in stress mode trying to shop for your family, friends, colleagues, and enemies. However, why not save that stress for the Boxing Day hangover and get everyone some much-needed premium sound quality in the form of Raycons. Raycons wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers offer a fantastic 
fantastic audio experience, whether it be for bass-centric music to richly narrated audiobooks, compact with useful features such as Siri and Alexa functionality, an almost custom, comfortable fit, and up to 54 hours of battery life. They make for the perfect all-year-round gift for every occasion, from the everyday speaker for the party that brings us all together, to sound isolating earbuds to ignore each other completely, all of which start at half the price of other premium audio brands. For me personally, I like to pop them in for cozying up on the couch and watching movies on my iPad, because having used them for a few years now, they reliably provide a lightweight peaceful fit for extended use, and with the ability to switch between three sound profiles including bass, pure sound and balanced, it gives me the flexibility to adapt to what I'm watching or listening to. For the next month, Raycon will have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. You can now find Raycons in stores like Kohl's and Walmart, but if you want to get the best deal and help out my channel, then head over to buyraycon.com slash Ryan to get 15% off site-wide with the code HOLIDAY. Raycon's website also offers free shipping, free returns, a buy now, pay later option, and of course, a 30-day happiness guarantee to safely test drive them for yourself. Late one night, a freezing traveller by the name of Calhoun is discovered near the fort and tells the men that his party got lost for several months during a blizzard after their leader, Colonel Ives, promised them a shortcut through the mountains. Suffering from hypothermia and starvation, the group desperately resorted to cannibalism, while Ives is said to have succumbed to madness and killed many of his group to feed his own appetite. If any of that sounds familiar, that's because it's pretty much a very loose retelling of the infamous Donner Party disaster that took place in the same time and setting of the film, where a group of American pioneers attempted to migrate to California but got severely delayed due to a misguided shortcut that led to much death, suffering and cannibalism. As a result, Hart rallies his men to venture to the cave where Calhoun's party, including Ives, are supposedly living, in what Hart believes to be a noble effort at living up to their duties, despite his men being the least heroic and stable individuals for the job. However, before their adventure commences, they are greatly warned by their Native American guides George and Martha about the curse of the Wendigo, yeah this movie has a lot going on, where legend says a malevolent spirit possesses people into eating human flesh, causing them to heal and rejuvenate with unnatural strength, but be cursed with an unending appetite. Wendigo folklore is uh, complicated, most of us typically think of Hollywood's interpretation of humans literally turning into cannibalistic monsters out of a desperation to feed, but in reality it's a much more culturally nuanced metaphor that rarely, if ever, involves an actual creature. To quote Chris Iyer, who is a native consultant on Scott Cooper's Antlers, the Wendigo is an allegory involving a spirit that comes to reconcile human wrongdoing. As Charles Bishop argues, it stems from the legitimate fears of starvation that were generated by new settlers, forcing their greed onto native lands that didn't belong to them, becoming what Basil Johnson describes as an image of excess, ending in a violent quest of self-destruction, as Marlene Goldman puts it. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I know what the most authentic portrayal of the Wendigo is in media, but I will take a stab at saying Ravenous certainly did its research by staying very faithful to the metaphor. As the film builds towards the Kiev, I was genuinely waiting for something to attack them, only for evil to exist purely in the form of Colhoun, who is revealed to have set up the Kiev as an ambush to kill and cannibalize the men. It makes the myth of the Wendigo supremely more tangible and grounded, as yes, there is a supernatural component to Calhoun being able to rejuvenate and strengthen himself through cannibalism, but more so in committing to the tried and true concept of man being the biggest threat to itself. I know it's become a massive cliché to play the man is the real monster card, but contextually it makes powerful sense here as Calhoun essentially plays a similar tactic to Boyd by sneakily bluffing his way to victory. Upon discovering the remains of Calhoun's party, including what appears to be Colonel Ives, Calhoun manages to flank and kill the men except Boyd, who mirroring his survival of the previous massacre, paradoxically both bravely and cowardly yeets himself off a fucking cliff to escape. 
Now, here's the thing, this twist occurs only halfway into the film, with the second half shifting focus to Boyd refusing his cannibalistic temptations after consuming Reich in order to heal his wounds from the fall. Boyd manages to make his way back to the fort, only to discover Calhoun has taken command, as he was in fact the murderous manic Colonel Ives this entire time. From here, it turns into a tense and paranoid character drama akin to Tarantino's The Hateful Eight, with Boyd attempting to expose Ives as an imposter, while the other men look at Boyd with glaring suspicion, especially after the horses are killed, quickly followed by Private Cleaves. It's worth highlighting at this point that what truly helps sustain the manically unpredictable and surreal energy of the film is the incredibly experimental score co-composed by Damon Alburn of Blur and Gorillaz fame, both of which I adore personally. At times, it's brooding and fearsome, while other times, it drastically changes the tone of the film to either comedic or borderline absurdist. I can see how the score might turn some people off because you could argue it does sometimes detract from the brutally morbid themes of the story, but I personally think it adds an eccentric richness to the dysfunctional family dynamic of the men as if they're from an irreverent sitcom. Think of it as Texas Chainsaw and its sequel parody. Part of it assists in emphasizing the psychological deterioration of its characters, especially since the story predominantly takes place from Boyd's unreliable and emotional disturbed perspective. While technically he is considered the straight man of the group, it's mainly because he's the only character sincerely making an effort to fight his demons by refusing to give in to self-destruction and greed. It's only after first embracing the ultimate symbolic greed, that being cannibalism, does Boyd push himself towards a faithful redemption arc after Martha tells him that the only way to overcome the Wendigo is to die and accept the fate he cheated once before. As Martha says, the Wendigo only ever takes and never gives. It's an unending cycle of greed. The story takes a somewhat cynical position that humanity will always struggle to transcend its inherent instincts to thrive and survive. For all the values instilled in us from honour to respect to even love for your fellow man, when shit hits the fan, it's astonishing how fast morality goes out the window. Even small, insignificant details like characters cheating at chess or drinking bourbon while on duty all play into the flawed nature of its characters. But there is something to be pitied about them. Hell, Ives' backstory is legitimately tragic. He explains to Boyd that he used to be depressed, suicidal, and suffering from tuberculosis, and effectively sold his soul for a second chance, but instead of making him grateful for his life, he became consumed by hunger and arrogance to fulfill a destiny to immortalize himself. Eat to live. Don't live to eat. His ultimate goal is to exploit something he was once a part of known as Manifest Destiny, a divine calling within migrants to expand across America, where he will set up the fort to be a cannibal den to consume future travellers. However, there is one final twist before we get to the conclusion, so if you made it this far and want to see this through to the end, brace yourself. To really hammer home the supernatural element, it's later revealed that Colonel Hart is still alive, after being fed human flesh by Ives to revive him and make him part of this eternal purgatory. Yet Hart confides in Boyd that while given new life, he's still doomed to forever repeat his misery at Fort Spencer until the day he finally dies. He talks about his near-death experience and his fears of drowning in darkness and the initial addiction to being brought back to life, but now that the adrenaline has worn off and he's back to square one, he realises there's nothing in life he wants, no reason to keep on living. In a way, Hart's purgatory transcends that of the other men, because he spent his life educating himself on what he thought was right and true, but these efforts to understand morality never brought him any happiness. He asks Boyd to kill him before taking out Ives, declaring he never knew why he joined the army or engaged in fighting. It may have seemed like destiny, but the outcome has only proved meaningless. 
I wouldn't say Ravenous deals with the meaninglessness of violence as it does use it as a metaphor for the inability to learn from your mistakes and embrace who you are. When Boyd fights Ives to a characteristically sneaky victory in which he traps both of them in a bear trap, Ives feels no shame in eating Boyd if he dies first, but asks Boyd if he would do the same if Ives was to die first instead. Yet, now wishing to honour his mission, as Ives finally dies, Boyd soon embraces the seam, bringing his purgatory to an end. That was really sneaky. There is a lot you can say about Ravenous. Hell, you could call it a play on the Wild West's history of lawless violence and the beginning of the Age of Morality where men became honourable, yet, as it stands, Ravenous is a richly told tale of savagery and survival that deserves all the love and attention it failed to receive in its time. Thank you all so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, we have two more videos left for 2022, both of them are Christmas themed. I am really looking forward to getting some time off of Christmas, as I'm sure all of you are as well. So until next time, stay safe, stay away from cannibalism, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.